let us continue and uh, let us see a little bit the direct kinematics of some typical structures. You will see that uh, nothing exciting is uh, here because everything is systematic. And we will uh, have a look of the way we compute the end effect or position orientation by knowing the joint position. Okay. So, what is the advantage of using uh, the dynamic table convention? We will see right right now. So, this is a three-link planar robot, and let us have a look a little bit uh, at the uh, variables. The zero frame is here of x zero, y zero, and z zero that is going out from the screen. Okay. The first, uh, this is the first joint. So theta one is uh, a degree of freedom. Actually, I can move theta one and change this angle. A one is the length of the link. Now, this is one of the parameters. As I told you, we are not going to learn how to fix this parameter. Just someone say, I mean, someone is telling us this is A1. Okay. And where are D1 and alpha 1? Those are zero for this specific structure. Then I have a second joint here. And uh, I have to pay attention a little bit here. You see here the second joint and X1 and Y1 that are fixed to the first link. When I move this link, X1 and uh, Y1 are fixed to this one. So let me make a little bit, a quick draw of it in order to understand a little bit. I'm just, uh, I know that I have to, sh to, to share the video, just one moment. Google. Okay, so Now, X1 is fixed to the first link. I have another link, second joint here, second link, this is theta two, and I have also here X2 and Y2. If I change theta two, this is the situation. Okay, so X1 and Y1 are fixed to this guy here. Those are fixed. While X2 and Y2 are fixed here. So they, they are in the end of the link, even if this is J2. Okay. Now, I have theta 2, A2 here. Uh, for the moment, do not pay attention to this W. Then this is joint 3, X2 and Y2. And this is uh, X3 and Y3 that are fixed to the last link. In particular, I put it in the end of, of the link. This is a three-link planner. Now, let us have a look at uh, the Derek Artenberg table. This is just the same draws, very small, uh, just to have the picture. I know that the variables are very small, but uh, is exactly the same as this one. Okay, it's just to have it in mind. Okay, now, for the first link, I have link number one. A1 is a number. For example, uh, could be, you know, one meter, uh, 20 centimeters, depending on the, on the size of the robot. 
alpha 1, d1 are 0, and uh, theta 1 is actually the joint position. For, so theta 1 is this angle. I need a sensor to measure it, okay? But a, it is an angle. Then for the second link, I have exactly the same, because for this, this structure, I mean, you can imagine that it's very, it's very I mean, uh, every, every link is, is similar to the other. I just uh, put the same uh, rotational joint with the same axis uh, in a successive uh, rigid bodies. So link one, two, and three, and this is the tenet tartan vertebral. I don't care how this has been computed, but uh, you need to understand how to use those numbers, okay? So the way I do it is simply, I go back uh, here. This is uh, the generic uh, homogeneous transformation matrix representing uh, a roto translation from one frame to another. I know that uh, alpha is equal zero. So for example, here, alpha is equal zero, uh, sinus alpha would be uh, zero, okay? And D will be zero. I know that I need to specify this for this structure. For the three link is the same. So this is the reason why here I have A connecting I minus one to I for I equal one to three. And this is the, I can make a comment that's the same as the other one. If I look at the third column, I have zero, zero, one. What does it mean? It means that Z is always parallel to Z zero. And this is uh, very easily to visualize since our robot is on a plane and it can only rotate around the Z axis, okay? Since this is a very uh, small structure, I can also write uh, the homogeneous transformation matrix from uh, zero to three. And this is the result. Okay, again, I have zero, zero, one here, cosinus of, of theta one plus theta two plus theta three. This is the, the notation that uh, we used. And this is the position of the end effector. Actually for, for a structure, as small as this one, this could be obtained by simple trigonometry. Of course, I don't care about this specific structure because now I have a tool for a generic robotic structure. I don't care who produced the robot. I don't care what is the shape, the color or whatever. If you give me the, 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 the table, I can compute position orientation of the end effector starting from the joint position. This is the direct kinematics purpose. Spherical robot. A spherical robot is characterized by one first vertical rotational joint. Then there is another rotational joint, but uh, with a 90 degree degrees uh, with respect to the first one. And then here I have a prismatic joint, okay? What is the uh, direct kinematics of this guy? Here I have first link, A1 is zero. Alpha one is minus 90 degrees. D1 is zero and theta one is actual variable, so the joint position. For the second, I apply the rules and I, uh, I have a zero, 90 degrees, D2 and theta two, three, zero, zero, D3, that now it is uh, the joint position. So I have a sensor that measure the displacement of this guy. Those three homogeneous transformation matrices represent the transformation between two successive frames. And this is the generic I mean, the non, not the generic, sorry, uh, the overall from zero to three homogeneous transformation matrix. Okay? And this is the symbolic expression. Mm, I don't have any, any specific comment on this one. Anthropomorphic robot. This is the, the, the old structure of a lot of industrial robots. 
a lot of the industrial robot uh, exhibit the first three link at this guy here. So one vertical rotational joint, and then those two that, if you look at uh, those two uh, joint, those represent a planar two link. Now, I apply the rules, I understand how to fix the frames, and then I'm able to compute the parameters. Something that, again, you don't have to do it, uh, but it's very easy conceptually. I would like also to, to, to notice that here, the zero frame is here, where the mouse, the pointer of the mouse he is. So if I apply the Dynamite Tartenberg convention, the, the zero frame is not on the ground. It doesn't matter because I always have another homogeneous transformation from a, a reference base or word frame to the zero frame of the robot. Okay, this is the structure. Dynamite Artemis table, homogeneous transformation obtained by multiplication of the individual homogeneous transformation. Nothing. Uh, exciting, nothing conceptually uh, difficult here, okay? Okay. Now, let us consider uh, another typically structure used to uh, implement the wrist. Uh, if you look at those three rotational joints, you see that uh, uh, those are only three rotational joints. If, uh, if you have imagine them very compact, they allow you to have uh, the, let me say, the behavior of the human wrist. The behavior of the human wrist is the ability to change orientation in a small volume of space. So let me say, if I fix my, uh, my wrist, I can change orientation of the end, I mean, quite in a wide range, okay? And this is given, this is, I mean, trying to emulate it by this structure. I can notice that the numbers here are four, five, and six. The reason is uh, due to the fact that usually this structure is in the end of a spherical or an anthropomorphic uh, structure. So the first three, are spherical and then are uh, or spherical, yes, so structure or uh, anthropomorphic and then a spherical wrist. Again, this is our nice uh, homogeneous transformation and I just have to notice now I write uh, homogeneous from three to six. And then I can compose with the other one from uh, zero to three, very easily. Uh, this structure is, no, is known as a Stanford robot. Uh, Stanford is uh, the name of a village in the United States where there is a university where it has been first developed this uh, structure in uh, research. It's given by putting all together a spherical structure and a wrist. So now I have six degrees of freedom and uh, I hopefully can reach uh, position orientation in the workspace uh, uh, any kind, but any kind is not true, we will see. The homogeneous transformation is this one. Now the symbolic representation is a little bit complex, is very difficult to read, and we are not going to read the symbolic representation of, for example, uh, the direct kinematics of complex structure or, or the concept that we are going to do later on during the class. This is the the the, the the symbolic representation. I'm not able to, to, to understand it by looking at the expressions. It's very difficult to debug. If, uh, if for example, here there is a, a minus uh, instead of plus, it's very difficult to, to just visually understand it. And this will be true and true for the following concept. In robotics, uh, the symbolic expression of what we are doing is complex. So we need to uh, avoid the bugs in two ways. The first one is uh, we need to be systematic when we developed our code 
and uh, we need to uh, be clear, write comments on the code. And then the second way, we need them to have a, a procedure to validate our code. So we need to, 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 to be uh, systematic in the way we write our code. And if we, sorry, if we understood, if we understood the theory, we can easily find the uh, mistakes, okay? The bug, because they're always bug. Now, this is an anthropomorphic robot with a spherical wrist. And for this one, the concept is much the same as for the uh, Stanford robot. I have the Dennett Artenberg table and I compute all the uh, position and orientation of the end effect. Okay. Now, this is a robot uh, developed uh, by DLR, that is uh, a, uh, a German research center located near Munich. The name is totally unpronounceable for me, it's uh, Doffland uh, Research uh, Robotics. And uh, um, if you look at that structure, the idea was, when they first came out with this concept, the idea was, if I want to put, to bring a robot on a, a, a space uh, shuttle, I do want to minimize the spare part of the robot. It means that I would like to have uh, the links as much as possible, one equal to the other. If you look at this picture, you can appreciate that the links, except for the base and for the last one, are actually one equal to the other. It means that uh, you don't have to have a separate spare parts for all the links, but you just need spare parts for one of one topology, okay? And another uh, curiosity of this robot is that every rotational joint is uh, perpendicular to the previous one. Also, we have seven degrees of freedom, not six. This concept is uh, the so-called redundancy, and we will uh, spend some time in, in understanding the concept of redundancy, okay? This is the DH table, and uh, everything you need to compute the direct kinematics. Symbolic notation, just go quickly because we will write programs to compute. Then this is the robot that we have in the lab. Uh, if you're going to take the thesis, uh, it's, I mean, there is a high probability that we are going to work with this guy. He is a seven degrees of freedom robot very compact, very small. We will discuss a little bit later on uh, robots uh, as this one, or the previous one, and industrial robots. There is a small difference. The, these kind of robots belong to the lightweight robot. Length of uh, DH parameter, uh, R5, whatever, we don't care. This is uh, the position of the frames, RGB, the, 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 the code color is X, Y, Z, RGB. Okay, so red, green, and blue. And here, uh, this is the draw that we, we made in the lab, and uh, this is RGB. Now, here there is a, a, a second table with respect to this one. This second table uh, represents a convention between the age and Yako. Yako is the name of this robot. Whenever you buy a robot by a manufacturer, the position of uh, the joint and the reading of the sensor does not, uh, with an high probability, I, I would say probability one, is not the DH. DH uh, is very common in uh, academic uh, university, but uh, every company as um, its own rule to decide what is the positive sense uh, of rotation of a joint, what is the zero, and so on. So you always need a mask. When you take the numbers from 
from the sensor, you always need a, a, a mask to convert the, the readings to the DH convention, because all your code is written with respect to the DH convention. Okay, but it's very easy. It's just a conversion. Humanoid robot. If you look uh, at this humanoid robot, uh, actually, maybe not, I'm not sure this picture, but if you look at this one, this is uh, a DLR robot, the one that I show you. And this other is the same. Plus, uh, here I have uh, some additional degrees of freedom of the torso. So you can write in a systematic way also the direct kinematics for this kind of robot. Okay? So arms are two DLR robots. And you can do it systematically. This is why we, we, uh, I have also this function, this, this example. Now, we do have in our lab this guy with 19 degrees of freedom. So it's quite uh, huge. Here, I have uh, two degrees of freedom on the base. The base uh, is all direction of base, so we, you can move it uh, in all the direction. Then there is one prisma prismatic joint uh, in a vertical direction. Each of the two arms has seven degrees of freedom. And then here, this is an RGBD that is mounted on a pan tilt uh, structure, so two rotational joint. Okay? And 19 without considering the fingers. Actually, this is one more, so it's, it's 20. But, but we are not going to study grasp or robot ends, so it's 19 for us. Okay? So now we finish with direct kinematics. What is the concept that uh, we should uh, uh, keep concerning direct kinematics? The concept is that we do have a systematic way to compute position orientation and the end effect with respect to a, a zero frame or a base frame. Okay, we only need the DH table. In this course, the DH table will be given by me. Otherwise, half an hour, one hour of work, and you compute the DH table of any kind of structure. Okay, this is the 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 main concept of today, together with the, the second part, that is the difference between joint and operational space. This is also a very simple concept. The next lesson, we'll start uh, trying to understand a little bit concept, new one, uh, a little bit more complex. But up to now, it's uh, quite definitions or systematic way. Now, we can define, finally, what's defined as a joint space that represents the configuration of the robot. I have a vector. This is a bold face. The font is bold face. So in base of our convention, this is a vector that is equal to a um, collection of n elements, q1, qn, real numbers, where Qi is theta for a rotational joint and D for a prismatic joint. All our exercises will be made by considering rotational joint. So let's try to, to keep it a little bit as simple as possible. So this is the rotational space. It is a, a space of n dimension. And this is our operational space. Operational space, the, the word operational means that this is where we want our robot to do something. Now, what is the dimension of, of the operational space? Well, we know the position. The position is 3. But what about the orientation? The orientation could be a minimal representation orientation, could be axis angle, could be unit quaternions. So this could be 3 or 4. For this reason, the operational space is 6 or 7. Now, the direct kinematics is simply this operation, this uh, equation, this formula, the one that we already computed for uh, all the other structure. Okay, so the, the, we come, we developed a systematic way to have the homogeneous transformation matrix. But of course, 
the passage from the homogeneous transformation matrix, position orientation is trivial because the position are only the are simply uh, the last uh, three component, the, the first three component of the last column, and the orientation we have to extract here from the uh, rotation matrix. For example, the operational space for a planar tree link, it could be, I say, six or seven, but if we keep our attention on the plane, I don't care to memorize PZ, and I only have the rotation around, around Z. It means that uh, my operational space can be more conveniently represented as a three-dimensional space. And this is the function, okay? Position and orientation taken from the homogeneous transformation matrix. The workspace is where I can arrive. I, I can go with my end effect, okay? So taken a joint, every joint has a minimal and a maximum value. If you look at my elbow, this one, I cannot go over this value and over this value, okay? And actually this changes from person to person. There are some person that can also go over pi here. It means that if I have, uh, if I consider all these uh, uh, limitations for the joint, I do have a certain volume where I can arrive with my end effect. Here, if you look at the first one, they decided that this is the allowed range of uh, joint position. The reason could be for mechanical um, uh, reasons, no, no, no other reasons, okay? Then the workspace is dexterous if you can reach it with different orientations. So there are a reachable where I do care only of the position and a dexterous workspace that I can arrive with different orientations. Let me show you. Uh, if uh, this is uh, a possible uh, position of my end effector as an end, uh, this is part of the reachable workspace. But if I care about the orientation, let's imagine that this is fixed. I cannot arrive with any kind of orientation, only with this one, okay? Let's consider a two-link planner, and let us put a minimal and maximum value to theta one. So theta one and theta two as a minimum and maximum allowed value. And here on the left, let let us uh, let have uh, sorry first a look at this plot. This is x and y. Okay. So now this is the first link with the first joint at the minimum value. Then here I have the second joint at the minimum point A, maximum and zero. I, I move the first joint to the maximum value. It is just by it is just an example. This would be a very a very uh, compact and not very, not very smart robot. This is minimum value for theta two, then I make rotate zero and maximum value, okay? So let us now have a look at the left hand plot, Q1, Q2. When Q1 is at its minimum and Q2 is minimum, I have the point A, this one. Okay, so you can recognize the various point. Then the maximum B is this one. So now in the joint space, I have a nice a rectangle. In the workspace, it is a little bit more complex. The kind of, okay, in this case, in a, it is an area geometrically, but in general case is volume. 
OK. Um, actually, accuracy and repeatability, um, I don't know why those concepts are here. Let me skip. We'll uh, repeat those in another point of, uh, of, the, of the course. Now, what is the redundancy? Well, we will study redundancy, but let us just try to start giving the concept. If I have um, a workspace that has less degrees of freedom than the joint space, okay, I have more joint than the workspace, I have uh, an intrinsic redundancy. The robot of DLR with seven degrees of freedom it is redundant because any kind of task in the operational space exhibits at x maximum six degrees of freedom. Okay. However, sometimes I only care about, for example, the position. In such a case, I say my task requires t degrees of freedom because it's only the position. In such a case, also a robot with six degrees of freedom is redundant because I'm not, I don't care about the orientation. If I want to hold a try, for example, I have uh, here a glass of water. I care about this angle. I, I care about this angle, but I don't care about rotation around the vertical direction. So for, so for the example of holding a tray, the functional, the functional degrees of freedom required is five. And also with a six degrees of freedom robot, I'm redundant, okay? So it's a concept that is related to, to the task. We will uh, uh, skip the kinematic calibration. I'll just give you an idea of what is it. You have the DH parameters coming from, from the manufacturer of the robot. However, after that you mount your robot of you, on your industrial setting, if you want to have uh, the repeatability of uh, sub millimeters and so on, you can say, okay, I trust the manufacturer, but let me estimate by myself again the length of the links, the angle alpha, and uh, the, 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 and, 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 this, and that's all. Okay, uh, so this is uh, an identification procedure that we are not going to do. It's identification is uh, everywhere. We need to make cell inverts here. Okay, uh, the, the students of um, Laria Magistrale Engineering Informatica they do know what we are talking about because cell inverts already appeared in Teoretic Systemi for, for just uh, two minutes. Uh, I, I'm aware of that. If you also add the elective class of identification, that is not now not anymore uh, given, it's been substituted by um, uh, robotics applications, you know what we are talking about. But we don't care. It is just the idea. Okay? that uh, we need to make calibration. Whenever we buy a sensor, a robot, uh, whatever, the first we need to calibrate. Okay, we stop here. And uh, uh, next lesson, we will, that, that is uh, tomorrow actually, we will discuss about a problem that is conceptually a little bit more interesting and where we start to have some subtotals that are related to robotics and what a robot is. Okay, so let us start, come back here, make a very small recap. We have seen three mathematical tools that we need in order to just to start talking about direct kinematics. From the conceptual aspect, I raise your attention on the orientation representations in the sense that uh, uh, this is something that uh, is not very very I mean, immediate or very easy to understand you, you need to think a little bit about 
the orientation representations. Homogeneous transformation is just a matter of be systematic, it's nothing conceptually difficult. And then uh, also direct kinematics. Uh, direct kinematics is, okay, give me a tool to compute position orientation of the end effector by knowing joint position, okay? And then we started with some definitions in joint operational space. All robotics uh, issues, uh, all robotics uh, nightmares or, or headache are given by the fact that we have our control in a joint space and we have our control objective in the operational space. And there is uh, a strange mapping between them because the joint space, of course, is the one, this one is if I move this joint, the operational space moves in a kind of strange way. Okay. If I want to move my end effector in a, a segment, if I look at this one and I move in a straight segment, this is done by a coordination of uh, the movement of my seven degrees of freedom of my heart okay and this is of course something that we should learn to do it and we will do it uh, in next weeks okay uh, this is all for today. Questions? Okay, if not, uh, one of you asked, okay, let me stop recording. One of you asked, uh,